Section three of the Outline of Science, Volume three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephanie Lee. The Outline of Science by J. Arthur Thompson. Section three, Interrelations of Living Creatures, Part one. The Balance of Nature, The Weird Ways of Parasites many naturalists have had the vision of the web of life but none so vividly as darwin it was central in his picture of animate nature by the web of life we mean that no creature lives or dies to itself that each life is linked to other lives often in obscure and unsuspected ways everything as the philosopher locke put it is a retainer to other parts of the vast system of nature balance of nature we have seen that green plants feed on air water and dissolved salts that by utilizing the energy of the sunlight they are able in the laboratory of the leaf to build these up into compounds and that on these products all animal life depends either directly in the case of vegetarian animals or indirectly in the case of carnivores there is a deep biological sense in which all flesh is grass this is one aspect of the balance of nature that there must be sufficient vegetable materials in an area to keep the animals agoing another aspect of the balance of nature has to do with oxygen and carbon dioxide few people realize that the bulk of the oxygen in our atmosphere has been formed by green plants which in the daylight are always splitting up carbonic acid gas and liberating oxygen into the air this oxygen is used by animals and by plants as well for keeping up the oxidation or combustion of carbon compounds which living always implies nutritive linkages the system of animate nature involves nutritive chains one creature being dependent upon another for sustenance animals eat plants or other animals or in some cases what plants and animals have made e g fallen leaves and stored honey in any case there is a continual circulation of matter from one embodiment to another there is an endless cycle of incarnations the codfish eats the whelk the whelk devours marine's worms worms feed on the sea dust meaning by that the microscopic organisms that swarm in the waters. A cartload of bracken is tumbled into a lock. It is acted on by bacteria which break it down into particles and simpler substances. On these and on the bacteria themselves myriads of infusorians feed. These in turn are devoured by small crustaceans, and these are devoured by trout. It is very important for practical purposes to discover these nutritive chains. The most insignificant plants and animals often play an important part in the economy of nature, or what we call the balance of life. Thus earthworms may seem to form a despicable link in the chain of nature, yet they are all important. Vegetation would fare ill without them. How well Gilbert White, 1777, appreciated their importance. Earthworms, though in appearance a small and despicable link in the chain of nature, yet if lost, would make a lamentable chasm. Worms seem to be the great promoters of vegetation, which would proceed but lamely without them, by boring, perforating, and loosening the soil, and rendering it pervious to rains and the fibers of plants, by drawing straws and stalks into the soil, and most of all by throwing up such infinite numbers of lumps of earth. The earth without worms would soon become cold, hard-bound, and void of fermentation, and consequently sterile. When he was a young student in Edinburgh, Charles Darwin began studying the work of earthworms, counting the numb solvent humus acids of the soil down to the buried surface. Their castings on the hill slopes are carried down by wind and rain and go to swell the alluvium of the distant valleys. Linkages Securing Survival The most important linkage in the world is that between many flowering plants and their insect visitors, as we have seen. See botany. The insects carry the fertilizing pollen from one blossom to another and bring about not merely fertilization but cross-fertilization, which increases the yield and the quality of the seed. Unless the egg cell, inside the ovule inside the ovary of the flower, be fertilized by a male nucleus from the pollen grain, the possible seed will not become a real seed capable of development or germination. Some flowers, like peas, are self-pollinating. In some other cases, like pine trees, the pollen is carried by the wind, but most flowers are cross-pollinated by insects and it has been proved experimentally that cross-pollination is best. Cats and Clover In illustrating the linkage between flowers and their welcome insect visitors, 
for there are others that do nothing but harm, Darwin told the cats and clover story, which soon spread round the world. Round a hundred heads of the purple clover he put muslin bags, so that air got in and sunlight got in, but no insects. From these hundred heads he got not a single real seed, while from another hundred heads without muslin bags he obtained twenty-seven thousand seeds. These heads have been visited by the humble bee, which affects cross-fertilization. So the more humble bees, the better next year's clover crop. But the nests of the humble bees are rifled by the field mice or voles, which are fond of the delicate white grubs. Therefore, the more field mice, the fewer humble bees, and the poorer next year's clover crop. But in the neighborhood of villages there are fewer field mice than in the open country, for the cats hunt them down, killing them though they do not eat them. Therefore, the more cats, the fewer field mice, and the fewer field mice, the more humble bees, and the more humble bees, the better next year's clover crop. It is easy to extend these house that Jack built stories. The more clover, the richer the pasture for the cattle, and the more roast beef for John Bull. The more kindly old ladies there are in the village, the more cats there will be, and this again will favor the clover. Thus cats and clover and cattle are linked together. It has been stated that in some instances the purple clover has seeded satisfactorily in the absence of humble bees. This may be due to the occurrence of self-pollination, or to the visits of some other insect, which fills the humble bee's role as pollinator. But the main fact is well illustrated in the case of a country like New Zealand. The Case of Red Clover When the farmers there first tried to cultivate the purple or red clover, it failed to produce seeds, for there were no humble bees in the islands. Bees were introduced and they multiplied apace. The raising of clover seed became commercially profitable. A subsequent importation of American species of humble bees, with longer tongues, readily able to reach far down into the floral tube, was followed by further improvement in the yield of clover seed. In one province, in 1912, an area of 610 acres was sown with red clover and yielded an average of 158 pounds to the acre. Distribution of Seeds Hardly less important than the pollination of flowers is the distribution of seeds, and again we may begin with a classic case from Darwin. When birds get their feet wet, clodlets of earth often form on them, and these may include the seeds of plants, and beside these, small animals or their larval stages. When the bird gets its feet washed cleaned at some other place, the seeds are liberated from the clodlets, and thus there is scattering of seeds. Many facts, Darwin writes, could be given showing how generally soil is charged with seeds. For instance, Professor Newton sent me the leg of a red-legged partridge, Cacabus rufa, which had been wounded and could not fly, with a ball of hard earth adhering to it and weighing six and a half ounces. The earth had been kept for three years, but when broken, watered, and placed under a bell glass, no less than eighty-two plants sprung from it. These consisted of twelve monocotyledons, including the common oat, and at least one kind of grass, and of seventy dicotyledons, which consisted, judging from the young leaves, of at least three distinct species. When a bird is killed and rots away on the earth, or is buried by sexton beetles, the undigested seeds in its crop may, similarly, be sown far from where they were gathered. Ants and Seeds Ants are particularly fond of seeds which have oil bodies or food bodies on their coats, e.g. violet, bluebell, mignonette, and fumatory. In some cases they eat only the external food body, so that the seeds thrown out from the ant's nest may still germinate. Moreover, in many cases the seeds are lost by the ants as they are carrying them home. Professor F. E. Weiss placed the seeds of gorse and broom, which have very distinct food bodies on the ants' tracks, and found that they were soon picked up, while the seeds of various other plants were left alone. It is reasonable, therefore, to conclude that ants assist in the distribution of gorse and broom. Freshwater Mussels and Minnows Another example of the way in which one creature depends on another for the continuance of its kind may be found in the linkage between freshwater mussels and minnows. The eggs of the freshwater mussel are produced about midsummer in Britain but they are not set free. They develop in a special brood chamber, the cavity of the basket-work-like outer gill. They turn into pedhead bivalve larvae, called glochidia, which are not allowed to escape till early in the following year. Moreover, they are not liberated unless a fish, such as a minnow, comes swimming slowly past. 
when the larvae are set free they swim in the water clapping their valves together exuding delicate gluey threads and making for the fish some lucky ones get attached to the minnow and burrow a little into the flesh here they undergo a great change and eventually drop off into the mud often far from where they were born it is very striking to find that a continental fish the bitterling rhodius amaris uses a long egg-laying tube to inject its eggs into the freshwater mussel the eggs develop in the mussel's gill chamber and the larval bitterlings spend some time there before they find their way out so the freshwater mussel is dependent on some fish and the bitterling is dependent on the freshwater mussel this is what is meant by the linkage and scores of striking instances will be found in books that deal with life histories one creature on another it often happens especially in a crowded area such as the seashore that one animal settles down on the back of another as rock barnacles on a crab shell or a tube inhabiting worm on a bucky this mode of life is called epizoic and it may be adopted by plants as well as by animals thus seaweeds are often attached to crabs and even to aged lobsters and a green alga grows on the shaggy hair of the tree sloth it may be an advantage to the epizoic animals or plants to be carried about by an active bearer to the bearer it is probably in some cases a burden but is often quite indifferent occasionally as has been noticed in the article on disguise it has a camouflaging utility there is a vivacious plover that lives in an interesting partnership with the crocodile as herodotus reported long ago observant inquisitive excitable clamorous and gifted with a far-reaching voice it is well fitted to serve as watchman to all less careful creatures no approach whether of beast of prey or of man escapes its suspicious observation every sailing boat or rowing boat on the river attracts its attention and it never fails to tell of its discovery in loud cries this sentinel is at home on the sandbanks on the nile where the crocodiles are wont to rest it often perches on the reptile's back from which it picks leeches and it will even jerk a morsel of food from between the teeth dr leith adams writes that the egyptians of to-day have put a tale to the account that herodotus gave of the partnership they say that in addition to its office of leech catcher to the crocodile it occasionally does happen that the zigzag so called for its note of alarm in searching for the leeches finds its way into the reptile's mouth when the latter is basking on a sandbank where it lies generally with the jaws wide open now this is possible and likely enough but the captain of our boat added that occasionally the crocodile falls asleep when the jaws suddenly fall and the zigzag is shut up in the mouth when it immediately prods the crocodile with its horny spurs as if refreshing the memory of his reptilian majesty who opens his jaws and sets his favorite leech catcher at liberty there seems to be two of these crocodile birds both plovers the black-headed pluvianus egyptius and the spur-winged hoplopterus denosius this case must serve an illustration of partnership but we may mention the small horse mackerels that sometimes swim about under the shelter of a big jellyfish's umbrella the beef-eater birds that perch on cattle and clean their hide and the pilot fish that accompanies the shark there is nothing hard and fast in our grouping of these associations and what we have called partnership passes insensibly into something more definite thus the little tiny pea-crab often lives within the horse mussel finding shelter and apparently food as well it is naturally difficult to draw a firm line where shelter stops and some sort of cooperation begins there is a brilliant indian ocean fish about two inches long called amphiprion that lives in association with a large reef anemone discosoma it lives among the tentacles of the anemone and retires into the food cavity on the slightest alarm it dies when it is removed from the sea anemone as mr banfield says in his delightful my tropic isle nineteen ten it is almost as elusive as a sunbeam and most difficult to catch for if the anemone is disturbed it contracts its folds and shrinks away offering inviolable sanctuary the benefit to the little fish is plain enough it finds shelter in crumbs but is there any benefit on the other side many sea anemones are in the habit of stinging and seizing small fishes which intrude inquisitively or incautiously but discosoma does not seem to do this to amphiprion it has been suggested that the brilliantly colored fish serves as a lure it seems more likely that the movements of the fish in and about the sea anemone keep up useful currents of water commensalism in a previous section reference has been made to an external partnership mutually beneficial between two quite different kinds of animals 
which is usually spoken of as commensalism, meaning eating at the same table, con together and mensa a table. The word is almost the same as companionship, eating the same bread. Fine instances are found in the associations between hermit crabs and sea anemones. Certain kinds of hermit crabs place sea anemones on the back of the bucky or other shells, which they have commandeered for the shelter of their flabby tails. There may be three or more sea anemones on the top of a big shell. The advantages to the hermit crab are that the anemones mask its real nature and that they can sting. In certain crabs, the sea anemone is actually fixed on each of the great claws, as if the crustacean made a weapon of the polyp. The advantages to the sea anemones are that they are carried about and that they get morsels from the hermit crab's meals, which are many. In this mutually beneficial partnership, there are several points of much interest. Thus, a hermit crab deprived of its partner was seen to stalk about restlessly, ill at ease, until it obtained another of the same kind. When a hermit crab has grown too large for its borrowed shell, it has to flit. This means leaving the sea anemones behind, but the hermit crab has been seen removing them from the relinquished shell and establishing them on the new one. A sea anemone removed from its partner was seen, after a while, to fasten itself to the leg of a passing hermit crab and gradually move on to the top of the shell. In certain cases, the sea anemone is never seen apart from the hermit crab and vice versa. Getting away from marine animals, we may notice that associations which may be called commensalism are well known among insects. Thus, Mr. William Beebe has recently discovered a minute blind cockroach, Atophila, that lives in the subterranean nests of the Atta leaf-cutter ants. They clean the bodies of the giant soldier ants, and seem to do no harm in the nest. We need not refer to other instances of commensalism which have been mentioned elsewhere in this work. We have also had occasion to refer to examples of symbiosis. Symbiosis the term symbiosis, which simply means living together, sin together, and bios, life, has been earmarked for mutually beneficial internal partnerships between two organisms of different kinds. Thus, a green alga lives inside the little marine worm called convoluta, and makes the worm a sort of plant animal, in a very successful association it is. The Double Life of Lichens it was the great botanist de Berry who first applied the term symbiosis to the partnership illustrated by those strange encrusting plants called lichens, which are so familiar on trees and rocks. They are even stranger than they look, for they are double plants, as we have seen. See page 610. It is impossible not to be interested in lichens, pioneers in soil-making, sheltering, and feeding those animals that are the outposts of life's ceaseless campaign. But is not their supreme interest that they represent a very distinctive adventure in evolution, the adventure of symbiosis? The Seamy Side of Heather Everyone knows that heather grows well on poor and unpromising soil where relatively few other plants will thrive. The water of the moorland is apt to be in such an acid state that the roots of plants cannot use it. The nitrogenous supplies in the soil are unavailable because bacteria do not flourish in peaty environment. The same is true of earthworms, which make soil elsewhere. What, then, is the heather's secret, for it certainly thrives on mountain and moorland? It has a partner fungus that sends its threads or hyphae not only into the cells of the root, but through and through the stem and leaves, and even into the seed box. The fungus acts as the intermediary between the heather and the soil. It absorbs water and organic material. It is perhaps able in some measure to fix atmospheric nitrogen. In any case, the heather has been able to effect a compromise with what was probably, to start with, a predatory intruder. Indeed, the compromise has gone so far that the heather cannot thrive without its partner. As Dr. Rayner says, the heathers have solved the problem of growth on poor and unpromising soils, but solved it at the price of their independence. The infection of the heather seems to take place shortly after the germination of the seeds, and it is a remarkable fact that the seedlings do not develop roots in a pure sterilized culture where there is no partner fungus. But infection with the right fungus brings about normal development. The heather's health and continuance depend on its symbiosis with a fungus. More information in regard to these partnerships will be found in the article on botany. End of section 3 Section 4 of The Outline of Science, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Stephanie Lee. The Outline of Science by J. Arthur Thompson. Section 4. Interrelations of Living Creatures. Part 2. Man and the Web of Life. If the world of living creatures is a vast interlinked system, the fact must be carefully appreciated by everyone who would operate on animate nature, and that is what man is always doing. If he is to control nature, he must first know and then respect the web of life. By ignoring it or defying it, man has brought much trouble upon the earth. Let us consider some illustrations of his mistakes and of his achievements. 1. Man is a distributor of plants and animals. About 1860 he took rabbits to Australia, and there, in the absence of their natural enemies, these adaptable creatures, though they will not take to Ireland, multiplied excessively and turned vast areas of fertile country into barren desert. Over a dozen times the European sparrow was introduced into the United States, partly in the hope of checking the elm tree caterpillars. This it did in some measure, but only to become itself a greater pest, doing much damage to the crops and driving away native insectivorous birds. The annual cost to the states amounts to a prodigious sum. Of course, man is not always doing such stupid things. He imports fruit trees into South Africa and wheat into America. He establishes turkeys from Mexico and Europe and sheep from Scotland and New Zealand. It must be noted, however, that his successes have been greatest with domesticated animals and cultivated plants, over which he had previously established some control. 2. Man has sometimes brought about very unfortunate results by encouraging, rather than directly extending the range of certain living creatures. Thus by careless and unthrifty ways of dealing with refuse and crumbs of all sorts, he has encouraged the multiplication of rats, to an extent that is ominous, to say the least. Many millions of brown rats are at present being supported in Britain alone, and the damage is not confined to the destruction of all sorts of stores. They foul much more than they eat. Furthermore, they harbor a dangerous human parasite, Trichinella spiralis, which has the pig as its second host, intermediate between rat and man. Again, the microbe, Bacillus pestis, of the bubonic plague of India, once known as the Black Death in Britain, is more or less at home in the rat, and is imbibed by the rat flea along with its meals of rat's blood. From a dead rat the fleas jump away, and an infected flea may inoculate a man with the bacillus of the plague. Nothing could better illustrate the intricacy of interrelations, and the instance becomes still more picturesque when we notice the report that plague is distinctly less frequent in those Indian villages that abound in cats. For the more cats, the fewer rats, and the fewer rats, the fewer rat fleas, and the less plague. 3. In many cases, man's disturbance of the balance of nature is just the tax that has to be paid on a laudable achievement. The potato beetle, or Colorado beetle, Dorifora decemlineata, which has occasionally shown face in Britain, used to be restricted to the central west of North America, where it fed on the deadly nightshade and did not multiply greatly, being kept in check by natural enemies. But the introduction of the potato plant, a relative of the deadly nightshade, and the great extension of potato fields year after year gave the beetle a chance for prolific multiplication. It spread gradually eastward, and its enemies could not any longer keep it in check. Year after year it continued its eastward march until it reached the Atlantic seaboard. Many counteractive methods had been tried, but the Colorado beetle remains unconquered and continues to levy a very serious toll. Yet no one can say that man was much to blame. 4. Occasionally man's nodding of the web of life is accidental, as in the diagrammatic case of the gypsy moth, Oneria dispar which a naturalist, Truvelo by name, imported about 1869, for some scientific purpose, from Europe to Massachusetts. By an accident some of the caterpillars got free, and although Truvelo did all he could to avert the consequences, he did not succeed in retrieving all the escapes, and the gypsy moth caught on. Along with another introduction, the brown-tail moth, it continues unconquered, to do terribly destructive work in defoliating trees in the States. But let us look at a brighter picture. In his valuable book on Organic Evolution, 1917, Professor R. S. Lull writes, One instance where nature's balance has been restored after being upset by human interference is in the case of a scale insect accidentally introduced into California from Australia on some young lemon trees. This multiplied until it became a most pernicious pest, 
which various mechanical remedies failed to control. Search was made in Australia, and a natural enemy, a ladybug, was brought over to California, with the result that the scale was not only reduced but almost completely eliminated. It was then found that the ladybug depended upon the scale for food to such an extent that it died in turn, and now protected colonies of scale insect and ladybug are kept in readiness to control future outbreaks of the pest. This importation of a natural enemy to counteract the destructiveness of an introduced alien has been tried in a number of cases with great success. 5. Sometimes man disturbs the balance of nature by eliminating, not by fostering. There is an Australian story which reads as if written for an instruction. On certain Murray River swamps several species of cormorants used to swarm in thousands, but ruthless massacres, ordered on the supposition that the birds were spoiling the fishing, reduced them to hundreds. But the fishing did not improve. It grew worse. It was then discovered that the cormorants fed largely on crabs, eels, and some other creatures which devour the spawn and fry of the desirable fishes. Thus the ignorant massacre of the cormorants made for the impoverishment, not for the improvement, of the fishing. The obvious moral is that man should get at the facts of the web of life before, not after, he has had recourse to drastic measures of interference with the webs of life. THE IMPORTANCE OF BIRDS One of the risks to which the balance of nature is exposed is the multiplication of insects. There are so many of them, and they are so prolific. Their overpopulation is often disastrous for a time in a limited area, as is familiar in an invasion of locusts. But this is obviated as a worldwide catastrophe by the changeable weather and by insectivorous animals. Among these, the place of first importance must be given to insect-eating birds. It is not possible to make precise calculations, but some experts have said that six to ten years without birds would suffice to bring our whole system of animate nature to an inglorious end a vast hecatomb of insects, devouring and smothering one another. This is the biological reason for opposing the destruction of insect-eating birds, except under careful scrutiny. That they are irreplaceable masterpieces of beauty is another reason of a different order, but not less cogent. One cannot pretend that the question of elimination is easy. One can only plead that wholesale massacres should not be permitted without the most careful consideration. Poisonous snakes are prescribed, but is it clearly understood that their destruction implies a multiplication of mice and other vermin on which many snakes feed? Anti-squirrel clubs have been started because of the damage done to young trees. A price is put on the beautiful rodent's head, and the heads come tumbling in. Sometimes, however, the squirrel club has had to be dissolved because of the over-multiplication of wood pigeons, which eat enormous quantities of grain, and may mean a serious loss to the farmer. The usually vegetarian squirrel levies toll on the young squabs of the wood pigeon. Just as man encourages rats without wishing to, so he discourages wild things without meaning to. Agriculture spreads, marshes are drained, forests are cleared, the stretch of wildness becomes a trim golf course. Therefore the wild cat becomes a rarity, and the pine marten disappears. The bittern becomes scarce, and the rough has all but ceased to nest in Britain. One hopes, however, that there is a fresh growth of a vivid and determined awareness that creatures like bitterns and badgers are national treasures of real value, not to be sacrificed any longer either to ignorance or to greed. A Multitude of Linkages Sir Ray Lancaster has summarized the numerous practical relations between man and animals, and it is instructive to consider their manifoldness. A. We capture animals for the sake of their flesh, e.g. hares and rabbits herring and whitebait. We kill others for parts that are not edible, the whale or its oil and whalebone, the pearl oyster for its pearls and mother of pearl. b. Other animals are bred for utilitarian reasons, e.g. pigs for their flesh, cattle for flesh and milk, horses for transport, dogs for their watchfulness, turkeys, geese, and poultry for the table, bees for their honey, silk moths and sheep for raiment, and so on. Sometimes utility is aesthetic, as in the case of canaries and goldfish. The keeping of pets, from cats to white mice, from parrots to poodles, may be included here. C. Then there are those animals that help man's endeavors. The earthworms have largely made the fertile soil, and the humble bees pollinate the clover. 
the fisheries are after all dependent on the multitudes of minute crustaceans in the sea soup and these on the microscopic infusorians and algae d there are other animals that hinder man's operations and bulk his experiments the poisonous snake bites his heel and the mosquito infects him with yellow fever in some places the midges are so rampant that life becomes a burden and the heaviest cloud of depression and despair that has ever rested on the human race is due to a contemptible threadworm the hookworm whose larvae enter man's skin from the fouled soil a knowledge of the life history of the intruding parasite is now making it possible however to check its deplorable ravages long ago in man's history the enemies that counted for most were large creatures such as lions and tigers wolves and bears but nowadays most of man's serious enemies are minute we may even say microscopic e besides those animals that directly hinder man there are the multitudinous enemies of his flocks and herds his farms and gardens the field voles are sometimes plagues the wood pigeons devour good seed the phylloxera spoils the vineyards the colorado beetle ravages the potato crop the number of injurious insects is legion Man's domesticated animals are attacked by numerous parasites. The horse has its bots, the cattle their warbles, the sheep their sturdy, and the pig has an internal menagerie. F. Others, again, attack man's permanent products and his stores. In warm countries the white ants, or termites, make sawdust of everything wooden, and imply a considerable check on many of man's operations. Also very serious are the grain weevils that do much harm in granaries, and rats are worst of all. Bookworms and clothes moths can be readily checked, but it is a more difficult problem to cope with cockroaches. G. Finally, there are those very useful animals which help to keep down those mentioned in the last three sections, D, E, and F, the hedgehogs that devour the slugs, the lapwigs that prey upon the wireworm, the ladybirds that check the prolific green fly, and the ichneumon flies that lay their eggs in caterpillars. Reference has already been made in the article, Evolution Going On, to Dr. James Ritchie's masterly book, The Influence of Man on Animal Life in Scotland, 1920, wherein it is shown with scholarly decision that changes have been brought in a few thousand years by man's domesticating and destroying, introducing and eliminating, preserving and cultivating. The outstanding lesson is surely that no creature lives or dies to itself, that the consequences of every move are not only direct but far-reaching till the game is done. The Story of the Gullery From one we may learn all, so we take from Dr. Ritchie's book a single instance of the intricate interlinking of lives. It concerns a colony of black-headed gulls, Laris ridibundus, which established itself on the white moss near West Linton, in Peeblesshire. In 1890 the moss was a typical heather moor, with peat and moisture underneath. In 1892, or 1893, a few pairs of gulls came to nest on the moss, and were encouraged. In 1897 there was a populous colony. In 1904 the number was estimated at 1,500 to 2,000 pairs. The vegetation round about the colony underwent a remarkable change. The heather was replaced by coarse grass, and that by rushes, and these by a forest of docks. These changes in the floor were due, of course, to the faunistic gull invasion. The poor soil, which only the symbiotic heather could make anything of, was fertilized by food refuse and excreta from the gullery. Moreover, the puddling of the surface ground by the thousands of busy webbed feet, and the surface accumulation of crowded nests, meant a retention of superficial water. At all events, the peat bed with its concealed and deep moisture was transformed into a surface marsh. But further changes were in progress. The grouse that used to frequent the moor took their departure. Teal ducks arrived on the scene, attracted by the marsh and the rushes. A single flock, when the gullery was at its height, numbered seventy. The grouse were out, the gulls and teals were in. Fifteen years passed, and the scene was changed. Man interfered again for he rapidly ousted the gulls from their tenancy of the white moss. The villagers were disappointed because the coarse grass they had been wont to cut had been replaced by useless docks. The proprietor, who had been using a proportion of the gulls' eggs as food for his young pheasants, was disappointed because the grouse had gone. So the edict went forth against the gulls. 
In the early summer of 1917 scarcely a gull was to be seen. The docks had almost disappeared, the rushes were giving way to rough grasses and even heather, the teal had gone and the grouse were returning. In a few years a slight imprint of man's hand had set in motion a complicated cycle of changes. The story is like a Darwinian diagram, and Darwin might have written the sentence with which the story ends. If the natural processes set a-rolling by a tiny and temporary interference of man can be so marked, how can imagination grasp the total effects of man's influence, impressed upon the world of nature often with great power, and persisted in, not for a few years, nor for a few centuries, but for thousands, nay, even for tens of thousands of years? The practical moral of this and every other story of interrelations is that man should be very careful in his interferences with the system to which he belongs. THE WEIRD WAYS OF PARASITES When one organism lives in or on another, its host, gets its food from it, has its life history inextricably bound up with it, and is not beneficial but rather injurious in its influence, we speak of parasitism but a clear-cut definition is impossible. Many parasites do very little harm to their hosts, unless these get out of condition. Many parasites are unimportant, unless they get into some vulnerable part of the body. Many external parasites clean up their host's skin. A parasite may become a symbion, as has probably occurred in the case of the heather fungus. There are many degrees of parasitism, from external hangers-on like fleas and lice, to internal borders like tapeworms and threadworms. There is also an important distinction between parasites that live in the food canal of a host, sharing in the digested food, as tapeworms do, and those that prey upon the living tissues, like the liver fluke, which feeds on the blood of the sheep's liver. It is not in the interest of parasites to kill their host. That is lopping off the branch on which they are seated. Perhaps the trypanosome which causes sleeping sickness in man is not so much a parasite as a predaceous infusorian, devouring man from within, as a lion might do from without. A very important consideration is that a parasite often establishes a live-and-let-live -live compromise with its host, and nothing remarkable happens unless the parasite is transferred to a new host which is not in any way accustomed to such an intruder. Thus transference to man is, as it were, an accidental episode in the life cycle of the trypanosome of sleeping sickness, not that the life cycle is as yet clear. It is important to see parasitism in its proper perspective. It is a way of evading part of the struggle for existence. Just as some animals have discovered caves, others have discovered hosts. The discovery usually means abundant food and safe shelter. It often involves a very riskful life history. It is an interesting fact that in some types, e.g. among crustaceans and insects, only the females are parasites, which suggests that the habit sometimes arose in connection with egg-laying and the protection of the offspring. Adaptations of Parasites Evolution is not always progressive, and it is illustrated in the adaptations of parasites as well as in the adaptations of birds. Parasites tend to go back but their very retrogressions may be effectively adaptive to the conditions of their inglorious life of ease. Let us take the case of a tapeworm, floating in the human intestine amid the half-digested food, and moored by its head to the wall. It is safe from all enemies, unless perhaps the medical practitioner with his vermifuge. It floats in a plethora of food, which it can absorb by the whole surface of its long tape-like body. It can live and thrive with a minimum of oxygen, and it has a mysterious antibody which preserves it from being digested by its host. It has on its head muscular adhesive suckers, and, in some species, attaching hooks as well, so that it is firmly anchored to the wall of the intestine. It sojourns in warmth and comfort without any expensive sense organs to keep up. With its low type of nervous system it lives a life of dull sentience. It has attained to what economists have called complete material well-being. But there is the seamy side of the tapeworm's life of ease, namely degeneracy. There are no sense organs. The nervous system is of a very low order, without any brain. The muscular system consists of smooth muscle cells, which contract sluggishly. There is no mouth or food canal. The reproductive system is complex, but there is a suggestion of degeneracy in the frequent occurrence of self-fertilization, a very rare thing among animals. Some tapeworms produce eight million eggs, 
and prolific multiplication is certainly common among internal parasites. There are two ways of looking at this. Abundant and stimulating food, such as parasites often command, tends to make the individual prolific. There is the individual and physiological aspect. But the continuance of the race is often very difficult in the case of a parasite that requires two hosts, as so many do. And we may conclude that those types which were constitutionally capable of prolific reproduction would be the successful survivors. It cannot be doubted that many animals enter the door of parasitism, but fail to leave it open for their progeny. So they die out in their asylum. The astonishing thing is that so many have succeeded. The dog is known to have about forty different kinds of parasites. Both man and the pig have more. In omnivorous types, the alimentary parasites are always more numerous than in those with a specialized diet. Some constitutions seem to favor or attract parasites. Thus the European oak trees harbor about a hundred different kinds of gall flies. It is not only the number of different kinds of parasites in one host that amazes us, it is also the numerical strength of one kind. Thus there may be ten thousand individuals of one kind of threadworm in the intestine of one grouse, the minute larvae being swallowed along with the leaves and flowers of the heather. Another interesting point is that particular kinds of parasites are usually restricted to one kind of host, one reason being that they cannot be adapted to a variety of surroundings. When the parasite requires two kinds of hosts for the completion of its life cycle, the host of the adult is in many cases an animal that habitually eats the host of the larval stage. Thus the dog eats the rabbit, and the bladder worm of the rabbit develops into a tapeworm of the dog. Similarly, the bladder worm of the mouse becomes a tapeworm of the cat. Man gets his two commonest tapeworms, Tania saginata and Tania solium, by eating imperfectly cooked flesh of ox and pig respectively, for these are the hosts of the bladder worm stages. The larva of the liver flue cannot continue its development in Britain unless it gets into a particular species of freshwater snail, called Limnaeus trancatalus or minutus. If it enters another species, it is unsuccessful. This is what we mean by specificity or individuality of life history. And yet the same liver fluke larva in some other countries is able to utilize another species of water snail. When we examine the food canal of a mammal, bird, or fish that has not previously been studied in this connection, we often find a new tapeworm or threadworm. We wonder how far this illustrates the role of isolation in assisting the formation of new species. Just as there is an Orkney vole and a St. Kilda wren, and a distinct species of land snail in each of the sharply isolated valleys in Hawaii, so there are different species of tapeworms, flukes and threadworms in diverse hosts. We wonder whether the apparently different species of parasites may not be to some extent the same species, slightly modified by the differences in surroundings and food. Here there is opportunity for important experiment. What is it exactly that parasites do to their hosts? Some absorb a good deal of digested food from the intestines. Some perforate the wall of the food canal. Some cause inflammation by vitiating the surrounding tissues. Some block passages, even blood vessels. The might of so-called Isle of Wight bee disease blocks certain air tubes and cuts off air from the muscles, besides feeding on the bee's blood. The sturdy worm of the sheep presses upon the brain or the spinal cord, causing serious locomotor derangements. Some tapeworms and threadworms secrete a toxin. Some peculiar crustacean parasites, e.g. saculina, destroy the reproductive organs of male crabs. In short, the influence of parasites is very manifold. The Romance of Parasitism There is something repugnant in most parasites. We cannot look at them without some ethical recoil. We know that they are creatures which do not fend for themselves. Moreover, many of them are far from beautiful, which may be to some extent the stigma of their degeneracy. A sluggish pampered animal is not likely to have pleasant lines. The mistletoe is pretty enough, but as it is only a half-parasite, it may be one of those exceptions that prove the rule. Our recoil is also in part due to a recognition of the menace that many parasites involve. The hookworm and the guinea worm are curses. All the same, there is an astounding, undeniably romantic element in the life histories of many parasites. Let us take the liver fluke as an instance. The adult liver fluke, Distomum hepaticum, lies like a flat leaf in the tributaries of the bile duct of the sheep and some other mammals. It is about an inch long. 
it sucks in the blood of the liver and it causes the disease expressively called liver rot like most internal parasites it is very prolific each being capable of producing fifty thousand eggs which are fertilized by sperms from the same animal a rare state of affairs is called autogamy the developing and shelled eggs pass down the bile duct down the intestine and on to the ground if they land on a dry place such as a pathway they soon die if they come to rest in a damp place e g among wet grass they continue developing for a time but they will not come to anything unless they reach a pool of water thus drainage of pasture land has greatly reduced the amount of liver rot in the pool of water a microscopic pear-shaped ciliated larva escapes from the eggshell and swims about actively it has two minute eye spots but no mouth or means of feeding so it cannot continue swimming for more than a limited period about eight hours during its swimming it comes near or in contact with many things such as stick and stone water weeds and small animals but it answers back to nothing save the touch of the little water snail limnaeus trancatilus which is very common in pools when the larval liver fluke touches the mollus it immediately enters finding the breathing aperture a convenient doorway we do not understand the specific irritability of the tiny brainless larva which leads it to respond to the touch of the only creature which will allow of a continuance of its life history it is a racially unregistered responsiveness but these are only words hiding our lack of understanding if there is no water snail in the pool or if the larva does not find it during the eight hours limit of its free swimming it will come to naught inside the water snail the larva loses its cilia and eye spots and becomes a sporocyst this gives rise by means of spore cells germ cells requiring no fertilization to five to eight larvae of another type called rediae these give rise in the same way to eight to twelve more rediae and these to twelve to twenty larvae of a third type called sursariae these are the young flukes at last with a billow bed food canal the beginnings of suckers and reproductive organs and the locomotor tail if a water wagtail were to swallow the infected water snail at this stage that would be an end of the parasites as well this is another chance against success from the moribund snail the tailed larvae wriggle out they swim in the water they swarm up blades of grass they insist as tiny white spots losing their tail in the process if the sun wither the grass the whole story is at an end the only event that will secure continuance is that a sheep eat the blade of grass bearing the tiny insisted larva from the food canal of the sheep the cesarea migrates up the bile duct to the liver and in a few weeks becomes mature in some cases the full-grown flukes die in the sheep's liver after reproduction in other cases they migrate out of the liver down the food canal and die on the ground the most important general fact is that the life history of the liver fluke shows a succession of risks of complete failure had it not been for their prolific multiplication liver flukes would have passed off the stage long ago pearls and parasites it sometimes happens that an irritant body such as a grain of sand gets in between the shell of a pearl oyster or a freshwater mussel and the underlying skin or mantle which lines the shell and is always adding to it see color plate facing page 650 round the intrusion the skin secretes layer after layer of mother of pearl or nacre and a sort of pearl is formed but this is not a true pearl it is usually adherent to the shell and has a solid foreign body sometimes opaque at its core a finer result is obtained when a tiny hole is bored in the shell and a rounded granule of mother of pearl is slipped in between the shell and the skin the hole is sealed up and the pearl is left to grow in this case the result is more homogeneous for the core is a mother of pearl but this never yields what is called a fine pearl an improvement on the previous procedure consisted in introducing into the skin of muscles little fragments of living tissue in the course of time these were found encased in concentric layers of mother of pearl yielding reputable pearls it is probable that this method is capable of great improvement what happens in natural conditions is rather different in the common edible mussel a pearl may be formed from a sac of skin cells surrounding an intruding fluke larva the skin cells secrete a sepulchre for the fluke delicate concentric layers of mother of pearl as the core is the tenuous remains of a very delicate and minute parasite the pearl that results has considerable opalescence 
Similarly, some naturalists believe that the fine pearls of the oriental pearl oyster are formed round intruding larvae of a tapeworm, but conclusive proof is wanting. There is considerable reason for believing that pearls often arise round nuclei of the substance called conchin, which is secreted by the skin as the organic foundation of the calcareous shell. A little blob of this clear secretion, formed in a skin sac as a result of some slight disturbance in the ordinary routine of shell-making, may form the centre of a really fine pearl, which is built up of numerous concentric layers of nacre. Theoretical Aspects In connection with evolution it is often asked how natural selection, i.e. nature's sifting and singling, can be expected to act on the little finicking details which are so characteristic of living creatures. To this very reasonable question Darwin himself gave the answer by the emphasis he laid on the web of life for in the gradually evolved and ever complexified system of interrelations there is a sieve of extraordinary delicacy which will discriminate between even minute fluctuations to the plus or the minus side an apparently trivial new departure is tested in reference to the established system of interrelations a shibboleth may decide the fate of a species another question often raised is as to the general progressiveness of evolution there have been retrogressions blind alleys lost races but on the whole life has been slowly creeping upwards through the ages. But why should it? This is a difficult question. But may not part of the answer be found in the gradual complexifying of the web of life? There is established an external system of interrelations which is always becoming more intricate. Take the linkages between flowers and their insect visitors in illustration, and this forms the sieve by which variations are sifted. In the progress of mankind there is an external registration of racial gains there is throughout nature just the beginning of this an external systematization of interrelations which we call the web of life finally it is important to acquire as a habit of mind the vision of the web of life it is distinctively the scientific way of looking at things to appreciate their interrelations to see nature and human life as well as a vibrating system most surely and subtly interconnected but in addition to the influence on our theoretical outlook there is the practical importance of the idea of interrelations. If we are to persist and advance in civilization, we must pay more heed to the web of life, to all the strange junctions in our lines of communications. We cannot play the game without observing the rules, and these include a recognition of the web of life. We are part of a system, in which it is not the first or the second consequence of a move that counts, but the sum of consequences. End of section 4